uh, introduce our lecturer today, and I never say guest lecture because the people that are chosen by my wife and they choose to come here are as much a part of this church as anybody else. I've known John for a number of years, uh, probably 20, 25 years, something like that. And so we've been around together. He's invited me to come to some different things that he's put together in Orlando. 25 years ago. It's always worked to try to generate light wherever he was at. He facilitated a number of metaphysical circles every month for as long as I can remember. His hats changed a little bit. He used to have a magician's hat <laughs> playing it to the stars and stuff on it. It was a little bigger than that, I think. More now. Um, so that's something that's changed with him, with, uh, John. Plus, he's got one or two more gray hairs than. <laughs> yeah, when I first met him. And that always reminds me, that's kind of funny. Somebody told me, I said, we saw a video of you on the travel channel about spiritualism. I said, really? I said, yeah, it was a long time ago. Though. I said, how could you tell that? They said, you had hair and it was brown. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of like uh, John and me here. I'm, well, I've got a few more gray hairs and a few less hairs, too. So. John currently is really involved a lot with walkabouts, with uh, youth uh, groups, with uh, a lot of things to do with nature. This is where his expression is now going. Uh, you can hear some very interesting things that you've probably never heard before today. I don't really want to take any more time up with John and uh, let him speak to himself. John Springer. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to come and speak with you. Oops. Break that up. I wear the top hat because I usually keep a rabbit in the hat. But the rabbit gets kind of warm in the summertime. It makes my head sweat too much. So he stayed home. <laughs> okay. okay. And a rabbit. So this is actually my fourth top hat. I wore out all the others, or they're too hot. This is my summer hat. So I'll take it off because I will, I will sweat. I welcome you all. I'm going to be talking about the, basically the church of the tree and the consciousness of nature. Now that terminology came about at a gathering that I was at. It was a Christmas party in which Steve Atkins was there. It was in the backyard of a, a lady named Ann Thomas, and she used to have a networking publication. And this gathering was of spiritualist readers and uh, psychics, and the more I've, the most I've ever seen in one place. And I went, oh my gosh, I, I know too many people here. <laughs> and, and I share, was sharing with a group of them, and I talked about some of my experiences, and how I was raised Methodist, and, and while I was in college, I traveled to Japan, and, and with uh, three Catholic priests, a Catholic nun, a Baptist minister, a Quaker minister, um, and a Zen Buddhist monk. You know, I know that begins, sounds like a storyline, doesn't it? <laughs> and I kept literally start crying every time a, a Catholic mass came about. And also noticed that the priests were having more fun than any of the other ministers. <laughs> and so and I even, we even stayed in a Zen Buddhist monastery as well. And so I really found myself really coming close to what I considered spirit in the Catholic Church. And I made the decision to become Catholic. I know a lot of people raised in that and saying, oh my gosh, what have you done? Well, it was really interesting because the priest that I took lessons from, this much older priest in Shelbyville, Indiana, stood up, put his hands on his desk and said, do not get wrapped up into the dogma of this church. Use only what you need to use and then discard the rest. And I went, well, this is really interesting. Why would he say this? Well, if you look at the word dogma, D-O-G-M-A, that's man's interpretation of spirituality. All of the religions of the world have dogma. If you reverse that word, you have the true nature of spirituality. That's am God. So as I was sharing with this group in the backyard of Ann Thomas, I mentioned about that. Oh, by the way, and I chose a saint that nobody ever heard of before, but I was confirmed. It was Saint Gudlach. 
It's spelled G-U-T-H-L-A-C. The priest goes, who? And the bishop goes, oh, he'll take very good care of you. You're the only one that's ever chosen him. <laughs> Come to find out, he was a, a hermit and lived on an island and wrote stories about angels and nature. In the, in the, in the years of the 700s. And so I thought that was quite interesting. I really found someone that I could align my energies to. So he probably is celebrating that what I'm doing now. So as people, as we're talking, and I also am a Unity member of the Gainesville Church in Unity, and also a minister with the uh, Pan American Ministries, I have a Doctor of Divinity in that. And so somebody said, well, what religion are you? And I pointed straight up, and then I pointed to a tree and said, Church of the Tree. And if you think about it, all the major religions of the world have a tree as part of their icon. A tree is very prominent in all the religions. You know, Buddha got his, his enlightenment under a tree, the Bodhi tree. And it's really interesting, and we have the tree of life in the Christianity. We've got a lot of trees that show up in all the religious literature of all over the world. But the thing of it is that most people haven't honored the trees. You know, and, and I brought up some examples of trees, the, the ballerina tree here and the enchanted tree. And so a friend of mine's three-year-old daughter years ago had said, Mom, people are not hearing the new language of the earth. She said, what are you talking about? She said, the trees are talking, the birds are talking, the flowers are talking, everything is talking. No one's listening. And that's the key thing is that God is all of creation. All of nature is all of creation. And we're not honoring all of creation. We were meant to be stewards of the planet. We were meant to take care of it, honor it, bless it, and love it. We've been mostly abusers and users of the planet. Now, in the year 2000 or, or 99, members of the fairy realm came to me and said, we want you to help us awaken more people to their role as stewards of this planet. Now, at that time, I was the uh, director of the Enchanted Children's Garden of, in Lake County at Aloha. And we had, a, we had a purple orb and a golden orb fairies that followed us around everywhere. We got pictures of them. The daytime, nighttime, it didn't matter. It scared the, little, the girl that lived on the property because the purple one showed in her bedroom. She didn't know what that was. But then again, I heard this same storyline from people from all over the world that got the same message at the same time. We need sanctuary. We need people to be more respectful for us. We need you to work with us rather than against us. It's really been amazing of the transformation that takes place when I take people out on a walkabout. I mean, I, Anne knows real well, and several others in this room know really well, you will forever see and feel the world through your set of eyes. And I want to share an exercise with you that helps you connect to all those realms. And it's called a heart connection. It's a very, very simple exercise. And what it does, it awakens your soul heart or your sacred heart. If you've seen pictures of Jesus and, and Mary and other masters, they, they show their sacred heart up around the thymus area, which is that depression at the base of your neck. We all have a sacred heart. So if you would do this exercise with me, it only takes about a minute or two. And this is an exercise I do with the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts. I tell the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts, it's, remember the, the movie E.T.? E.T. had a heart light. We all have a heart light. Never let your heart light diminish. When E.T.'s heart light diminished, all of nature around him diminished. That's how I bring it across. They love it that way. So put your hand, either hand, it does not matter, on your heart, on your thymus area, or your high heart, we call it. And just sort of close your eyes and take some long deep breaths, a minimum of five long deep breaths. And 
as you're breathing, you begin to feel a warming sensation between your hand and your heart. You're awakening the soul heart, that aspect that we're, that we're, we're connected to all realms of God, seen and unseen. It is through this point we can truly communicate and talk to the trees and to the flowers and to the butterflies and to the dragonflies and to the dolphins and to the wind and to the rain. It is through the heart that we're connected. We hear that in stories and writings this you know, through the heart we're connected. Very few get you really connected. This connects you heart to heart, soul to soul, from the inside out rather than from the outside in. Feel that connection. Very good. And if you don't feel it right away, do this again. Do it at least three times a day. It also helps finding parking spaces and getting on the interstate. Now I follow a guidance called Gus. And Gus is God, goddesses, guides, and guardians upstairs. And how I met Gus is when I was at a light link gathering up in North Carolina. This lady named Beverly Watson of the Sevenfold Foundation, she's now in Texas, came in and said, Gus said I needed to be here. And I said, well, tell me more. And she said, well, Gus told me I was going to meet a healer that works with music and the angels. I said, well, let's see, I'm a healer. I have a music massage table, and it's surrounded by angels. That may be me. Uh, who is Gus? She goes, oh, that's God upstairs. Oh. I like that. May I adopt Gus? Oh, yes. So Gus has been a... a, a in, I'd rather walk with the deity as my friend rather than a beyond me. And so I refer to Gus a lot. And, and it's amazing how many others have adopted that. Now, the heart connection, I'm going to get back to that. This is where we... I'll give you an example of using this. One of our exercises, what we do, especially in the fall or the winter time, is talking to chameleons and azaleas. They're not noted to have a fragrance. They're noted for their beauty, but not necessarily their fragrance. So I have people smell the flowers and tell me what they smell. Usually it's not anything. So now step back to the heart connection and start loving the flower. Start acknowledging the flower. Tell it how beautiful it is, how wonderful it is, how much you appreciate it being here. And then ask it to release more fragrance. And usually nine times out of ten will release fragrance. One lady smelled this double pink and white camellia. And we all smelled it beforehand. There was no fragrance. She did the heart connection, talked to it, started laughing after she smelled it. I said, what are you laughing at? She goes, smell it. It smells like peppermint. It was. It was peppermint. Now, I shared this same story with the Unity Church of Panama City. And all the flowers in the sanctuary released their fragrance. They waved through the congregation twice. And again, it's that aspect that we need to honor in you know, all of creation. Now, I want to share with you about a healing. And we did some healings here. There's, trees are our healers. Trees are our friends. Patricia came home one day. That's my wife back there, by the way. In the pink. And she came home one day and she was very stressed. Oh my God, she was stressed. I could see it in her body, the way she was carrying herself and her face. And I went, so what's your pain level at? And she goes, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's an 8. Oh, we need to go out and talk to our tree. So she goes out there and she made sure there were any ants. And she, made, you know, she was talking to the double oak tree. And she was thanking the tree for providing shelter and shade and for finding a super highway for the squirrels. And then she goes, oh, by the way, could you please take this pain from my body? And she was out there for maybe about 10 minutes or so, and she came back in smiling. Her energy had totally shifted. And, and I'd seen her face and the way she carried herself, and I said, so, what is your pain level at? It's one half of one. Oh, good, you can, that's your stuff. You can deal with that. Now, I've used this exercise with a lot of our walks. I had an 84-year-old walk with us, and she was very, very concerned that she wouldn't be able to walk with us. But she had so much stresses and pains. Well, she hugged a lot of trees that day. She walked the entire park with us. 
I called her that night and the next day, and she goes, I haven't felt this way in 30 years. I'm going to go out and find a tree. Now, I want to tell you about connecting with that tree. Once you make it a connection with that tree, now, during one of our enchanted tours of North Carolina, again, Patricia was stressing in the car, and we'd been in the car a long time, and her body was beginning to seize up in the very places and all of And she goes, I just don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, see the help, and I said, tune in to the tree back home. And ask the tree back home to take your pain from you. So she did. All of her pain went away. Once you establish a relationship with the tree, you're forever connected to that tree. Now think about when you were younger that you had a tree that you connected with when you were growing up. A tree that you may have climbed a lot, something that you did a lot, something you may have, one that you may have planted. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I, we had a house after I left, left the farm. And by the way, the farm was quite an interesting experience. I, just, I wanted to do a sidebar on that is because when I was on the farm, there was a 40 acre farm in Indiana. We actually had an airplane before we had indoor plumbing, because my dad made aircraft radios for a living. And we had this monstrous tree by the farmhouse. It was a silver maple. And it was two and a half times taller than the house, which was a two and a half story house. It caught a lot of airplanes and a lot of parachutists. And my, I found out that my Uncle Clem had planted it. I never met Uncle Clem. I can't even find him in my in family records, but everybody talked about it, Uncle Clem. And he planted this silver maple. And it grew above everybody else. And because it was the center of activity, I played against it and on it. The swing was on it, so I, it was a happy tree. And so and I enjoyed the time on the farm because my mother said I sat on the cows when I was three years old. She would look out the window and I'm sitting on a cow at three years old. And, it's, and that explains why I got addicted to salt because I would share the salt licks with the cows. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember calling a hawk out of the sky and having land closer than Anne is sitting to me now. And I would literally jump into his body and fly through his eyes and see the countryside through his eyes. So when I started school, I thought everybody did this. I was wrong. I was from a different planet. I really was. So when I got, when we moved into the town, into Indianapolis, actually it was my grandmother's farm that we converted into the uh, neighborhood. And we had 18 trees on the property. There was one place that tree kept dying. Like every time they planted a tree there, we kept dying. But it was the place where they dumped all their, their paints and their solvents and everything else. So my mom says, go find a tree and, and plant it there. So I dug it out the whole, I knew what was buried. But there were shingles, there was all types of crap up there. And it made this huge hole. And I prepared the hole and put water and fertilizer and all this. And then I went and found a tree. It was about this tall. And I talked to the tree and I said, listen, I'm going to be moving you pretty soon. I didn't know what kind of tree it was. But it was a beautiful little tall sapling. And sure enough, I moved him. On the, uh, and that night it rained. It was being blessed. But, well, I come to find out it was a silver maple. <laughs> And I went back years later and, and visited that tree. And there was a tree house way up in the branches. And it got to be taller than all the other trees on the property. And there was a playhouse beneath the playhouse. And tree house and playhouse. It was the only tree in the yard of all 18 trees that had any activity. It was a happy tree. And I remember talking to the tree and I could feel eyes upon me. And sure enough, it was the kids that lived in that house that I used to live in. They were watching me. So when I got ready to leave, I got some leaves from it and everything else. They go, what were you doing to our tree? Oh, well, I planted that tree so I have a reason to come back and visit it. And one young lad said, well, my parents live across the street. And, and they're talking about moving. I think I'll go find a tree. 
to plant here so I have a reason to come back. So I said, go for it, have fun. So years later, I went back again and visited with the tree. The tree house was gone, and the playhouse was gone, but there was still a swing and a glider beneath this tree. And still, it was the only tree in the yard that had any activity. He really loved that tree. So find your tree. It's very important that you find your tree and identify it and love it and acknowledge it. Because truly, that is the church of the tree is connecting into that. Now, I want to share something about the heart connection. And part of what our aspect is, is that we forget. That I don't know if any of you remember that, that TV show called America's Greatest Hero. And he was given a flying suit and, and from the aliens. And he lost the instruction book. That's who we are. We're given a flying suit, but we're not, we lost our instruction book. <coughs> and he was able to finally learn how to fly, but he couldn't land. He was crashing into trees and cars and buildings. And that's how we are. We sort of learn to fly, but we don't know how to land. So, the, 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 um, and so I give you all permission to remember give you permission to remember your divine connections, permission to remember all your divine gifts, permission to remember the wisdom that's within you, because you're all connected to that. You don't have to read books for breakfast, and, but you have to learn how to access the wisdom that's found within you. And the reason I bring this up, I remember going across, to recall going across the Howard Franklin Bridge, that's the interstate bridge from Tampa to St. Petersburg. And I was driving my little mini RV, and my lady friend goes, you know, if you send love to the dolphins, they'll come jump for you. Oh, really? I didn't know I could do that. So I put my hand to my heart, and of course the other hand's on the steering wheel, and I'm going in my head, I'm saying, dolphin, dolphin of the sea, even though I do not see, come and jump for me. Dolphin, dolphin of the sea, even though I do not see, come and jump for thee. And I add some more verses and all of and then finally I start saying it out loud. I'm still on the bridge, and I go, oh, by the way, I'm in this box called the Dolphin, <coughs> headed towards the sun on the big bridge. At the end of the bridge, my lady friend's going, oh, my God. I look across, and there's a dolphin looking me in the eye, 30 feet up, making this turn to go back down. So I said to her, so what are you surprised at? You're the one that said, I can do this. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't expect that. I did it. She's like, oh, that's rolling. You said jump. <laughs> so I tried it again, coming back several hours later, and sure enough, three dolphins come straight out of the water. Now, I've shared this exercise with many, many people, and I'm amazed how many times it's worked for other people. It's not just me. It all was available to you as well. And we've even had whales jump out at the same time the dolphins come out, especially over here on the Atlantic coast. Amazing stuff. And that's a problem. See, I, we forget that we're so connected and you know, it's, that the church of the tree allows it to happen. It's a consciousness of nature. Everything is talking, it really is. Now, I'm going to step away from the mic for just a second. I brought a book called Tree Whispering. Now, it's the Nature's Lover's Guide to Touching, Healing, and Communicating with Trees, Plants, and All of Nature. It's written by a gentleman named Dr. Jim Conroy. Now, and he has a PhD in plant pathology. And what's interesting of why I bring this up, because it's a very definitive scientific aspect of tree whispering, of talking to trees and hearing them. But when I saw his photo, I'm like, you know, he looks very familiar. And come to find out, he was walking the hallways of the horticulture building at Purdue University at the same time I was. I was working on, well, I started out in forestry, actually flunked out of forestry. And I graduated landscape architecture. And he was working on his master's and PhD during the same time period, in the same building. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we have met. And so I'm thrilled that you run across someone that actually is seeing and, and connecting to the trees as much as I am in a different way. He and his partner, uh, Asa, 
Alexander just completed doing a workshop at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. He said it's very popular. And that, think about it, people really are hungry to, ha to have those connections. Now, now through Anne DeLong, I have a, uh, made a new connection. And it's a lady named Laura Walters. You probably don't remember, it's through a Facebook connection. And she has a website called beingenchanted.com. And that's her enchanted tree over there. And uh, she said to me, and we talk, when we talk, we talk for two or three hours. She writes like I talk. She and I are so similar in the way we see the world. And, through, and, and she's excited to come across someone else. She literally told me, she was praying, literally praying to the angels to have someone connect with her that saw the world as she did. I called her that day. It's just amazing. And we've been back, we're good friends and all this. But did just check it out to see what you see in that picture. On the back of that poster is the actual guide to the things that you may find on there. This is going to be in her, her next book is on her website as well. So, and another thing, when we do our walks, and I can tell you, we do some really interesting walks. I point out fairy doors, which are openings at the base of trees, and gnome homes, which are an extension of, uh, of from the base of the tree. We, we tell people three key things before we walk. One is that if you see a leaf waving at you, wait back. Chances are the leaf will stop waving. Now, I remember going to Lake Okahunka Park, and then we came across this, a, a waving leaf, and everybody in the group waved at it, and it was still waving. Well, the doubter of the group was the father-in-law. He was lingering behind. He was really not into any of this. We went, Ray, come up here. I think you need to, lit, to wave at that leaf. He waves sheepishly. The leaf stopped waving. Oh, it got his attention. He started paying attention. He was pointing out stuff before we were finished our walk. Then spinning leaves, you come across spinning leaves. Spinning leaves, you can talk to it mentally or out loud. You can get the speed up, slow down, change directions, or stop. The first spinning leaf I encountered was at Casadega. And sure enough, every command I gave it, it did it. I had a bunch of boys that, they had four boys on a walkabout. It was a breezy day, and you would think because the, it's breezy, and the leaf is spinning because of the wind. Well, they, all four of these boys said, stop. And that leaf went, and stopped right there. And then across the way, there was two waving leaves. The two younger boys went over, and they waved at the leaves, and they stopped. I said, back up. They backed up, and I said, and the leaves started waving. I said, now we'll step forward and wave at the leaves. They stepped forward, and the leaves stopped. They were there 15 minutes doing that. <laughs> now, the third thing is that the pixies are around. And I got a sidebar on that, on the pixies, but if the pixies are around, They'll put rocks, leaves, or dirt in your shoes or entire shoelaces. Now, I, I had, a, had an enchanted one and one. I worked with two Girl Scout councils. The Jacksonville Council, we had a group of an enchanted wonderland. It was a full day program. And one girl goes, and we were in a circle of all 130 girls and leaders. And one girl says, I'll show those pixies. And she double ties her shoelaces. As we're standing there talking, her shoelaces came undone. And she is freaking out. And I said, just because you cannot see them does not mean they do not exist. There's many realms out there existing with us. And this is indeed one of the, of the realms. And so it got her attention. And how I know about the pixies, I sent my dear friend Dickie Jo Mullen out to a property at the Yamaha where I was going to do a full day fairy round play shop. And I get an email back from Dick, Dickie Joe saying, you need to talk to those nasty little pixies. Those little, little characters got me lost in the woods for two and a half hours. I ended up a half mile down the road. <laughs> oh, great. I get to go out and talk to pixies. So I go out there, and I knew where they were at. And I said, listen, listen well. I don't care if you put rocks or leaves in their shoes or untie their shoelaces. Just don't get anyone lost in the woods. Well, we didn't lose anybody. Everybody's shoes came undone. I pulled out a leaf that was three inches long and an inch wide. I, my foot was never on my shoe all day. But when I pulled it out and looked at the leaf, 
All I could hear was laughter. <laughs> and they said, well, you gave us permission. <laughs> now you got a point there. So it's amazing what will show up. I got pictures of fairies and all, and gnomes and all this in my, in my album book. And when you go out into nature, if you're being compelled to take a picture, please take a picture. Do not ask why you're taking the picture. I'll give you another example of that, this, but, but in reference to orbs. I had, a dear, I had two dear friends, um, uh, Willie Pruitt and Angel Ross, and Angel's very connected to orbs and fairies and energies, whereas, and she's very much in her heart, whereas, uh, Lindy Pruitt is very much in her head. She's asking why this, why that. She's always taking a workshop. She's always so I, they had the same kind of digital camera, and we were at the Enchanted Children's Garden, and, and it was dark time, and, and I knew where there was a lot of orbs and fairies hanging out, and I had them take the picture at the same time. I stood behind it to watch what was going on, and the flash went off. It looked like just one camera taking. Well, Angel's pictures, there was orbs and fairies everywhere in her photograph. Winnie's picture, there was none. None. And that's only because she was in her head. You have to be in your heart. And truly connect with that set consciousness of nature. Again, all of nature is waiting for you. You know, we're, you know, we're only club men of the universe. Stop pitching at you about at the front desk about your vacation plan and start enjoying yourself. And that's what I try to do with my aspect. I'm a be a joy person anyway. The joy is just observe yourself. So I want you to, uh, to take a look. And now let me see. If there's something else I wanted to share with you. You know, I have to let you know that I had no clue what I was going to talk about until I started talking about it. But the, I want to, oh yeah, I want to mention what the Girl Scouts have said to me in both councils. They said, my programming has changed the girls and made them all happy campers. They now wave at leaves, they talk to butterflies, they talk to flowers, they talk to dragonflies, and they hug trees. They said, we've never seen the girls so happy. So this year I'm working with uh, seven weeks with the Girl Scouts at two of their camps. I'm doing the camps at uh, Mead Gardens. And the emphasis this year is on nature, it's on trees, it's on environmental. And I do that when we walk. My, my programs are educational, scientific, and magical. You know, with my degree in landscape architecture and minor in forestry, master's in environmental education. I'm also a, uh, elected uh, to the executive board as a tree advocate for the Florida Urban Forestry Council. Now, I have to admit, when I showed up at the first board meeting, I had my hat on, I had my rabbit in my hat, I had sparkles all over me. And I was approached, literally, to put my name in for voting the year before of that year to be a member at large by other members. They were voting on me before I became a member because they wanted someone that was connected to education and children. And none of the foresters, arborists, landscape architects, none of them were connected in that way. So I recall one of the uh, foresters saying, I think you're here to teach us about the spiritual side of trees. I said, I accept that assignment. And another one says, I think you're here to get us to have more fun. I accept that assignment as well. I think everybody's wearing my top hat now. But they have lightened up tremendously, and they're listening to me. And they're realizing that I really do have a lot to share, even though I'm out of the box. I told the president, and I've been trying to put together a proposal for it, so I told her, I says, I'm so far out of the box, I can't find the box. And it's true. I just I just feel so connected in, in the end. I can talk to the women in our, our full day programs and teach them how to do all of this. But just in the regular walkabout, we're going to be at uh, um, Dunlot and Sugar Mill Gardens this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And we're meeting several people there. And Dun if you haven't been there, it's a magical place. It's Dunlot and Sugar Mill Gardens. It's between US 1 and Nova Road off of 
Herbert. And it's a, a, a historical site and a beautiful uh, covered facility for their sugar mill there with great interpretations. There's a huge oak tree there. A lot of weddings have been held there. There's a grotto there where a lot of people have captured fairies in their photographs. And it's just a magical place. You have a lot of magical places in around here and on the coast where. Another one that we go to a lot is uh, what I call the Secret Garden. That's Ormond Beach uh, Art Museum and Gardens. Most people don't know that. I mean, uh, the, the uh, gardener there, Jeanette, said most people do not slow their lives down enough to notice the gardens. And it is. It's three acres of artesian wells and ponds and wildlife. And, and I, when we did our Enchanted Walk-Up Facilitator training, that's where I did their final test, to see how they would share their joy with others. And, and Jeanette, we were there on Wednesday, and Jeanette says the only time this park is crowded during the week is when you show up. Because all of a sudden people come out, they want to see and feel things differently. Another place in Ormond, north, 15 miles north of Ormond, is Fair Child Oak. Just remember that, Fair Child Oak. This is a live oak that's 27 feet in diameter. It took nine of us to hug this tree. It's not the largest tree. I mean, the oldest tree. It's, not the, it's over 2,000 years old. And the largest tree live oak in Florida is at uh, Lake Griffin State Park north of Leesburg. I want to climb up in that city. But it's, I have to have a step ladder to do that. It's one of these monster trees as well. So you've got some great places around here, but every place is sacred. Talk to your flowers, talk to your trees, talk everything. They're wanting you to get connected. They're wanting you to honor them and respect them. We've noticed, Patricia and I noticed that when we pick fruit from a tree, the tree loves us back. We get this overwhelming feeling of love that the tree is loving us back. The fruit becomes sweeter because we took time to love the tree. So take that in mind. And uh, I really appreciate all of you having me here. Now, the walkabout at Dunlawton is uh, on at uh, 4 o'clock. And, and it is $20 per couple. I mean, married couple or a couple of friends, $15 per person, $10 for seniors, 70 or older, you have to show your ID, <laughs> and uh, $5 for kids, so 5 to 15. And this is our standard rate when we come out of Orlando. I did a walkabout yesterday in Houston, and so they had 16 people on with us. So thank you very much for the t opportunity and the time, and, and it's it. now. Is there any questions? Okay. I don't have a question, but I talk to the waves every time I go to the ocean. Yeah, that's one of our exercises we do when we do the beach side. But we do we do very round play shops at Washington Oaks. We have a section in the gardens, and, and there's an exercise that we have people do this over the edge of water, and the, and the water will jump up to 12 inches. It's working with water strides. And we do a section in the trees and then a section on the beach, which is the beach and the rocks. And it's smoothing the waves and talking to the dolphins and talking to the birds and uh, splitting the waters. And oh yeah, as we approach as we approach hurricane season, you can put a protective dome over your property. Dome, dome, dome to the four directions. And you'll be amazed at how protective your property will be. If you don't want rain, if you don't want the storm, but you want the rain, put up a sieve. Now, I have a quick, quick point on that. Some of you know Ron Van Dyke. Well, years ago when Faye came through town, and I, Faye went, oh, your name after a fairy, I can talk to you. We need, we need water in the Everglades and Lake Okeechobee, and we need a, and uh, Ron in Melbourne says, oh, we need lots of water. No, Ron, they gentle soaking rains. No, no, we need lots of water. No, 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 gentle soaking rains. No, we need lots of water. Okay, Ron, you got your lots of water. So everything, and you all know it, 32 inches of rain fell. We had gentle soaking rains on our side of the interstate. And I called him up and I said, well, did you get your lots of rain yet? Are you treading water yet? 
He goes, I see what you're talking about. Oh, my ass for gentle, silky reins. So be careful what you ask for. All of the universe is listening. They're wanting you to connect. They're well, but remember, come through the heart, not through your head. Thank you very much. Be enjoying. Thank you.